Good evening and welcome to our MOAS virtual talk. My name is Seth Mayo and I'm the curator of astronomy at the Lowell and Nancy Lohman Family Planetarium uh, at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach. Glad to have you all here tonight. And for some of you, a second time. So thank you for returning. And I wanna wish everyone a happy International Day of Women and Girls in Science, which technically was yesterday, uh, but it's something that deserves recognition uh, for more than just one day. Of course, a day where we can celebrate uh, inclusiveness and diversity in science by the amazing women and girls that are currently a part of it uh, in some way and will hopefully be so uh, in the future. This was a day first recognized in 2015 by a resolution from the United, uh, United Nations General Assembly. We celebrated this for the first time at MOAS last year, which is great. And we're very happy we can continue this new tradition this year in a safe and uh, virtual environment, which we're all, of course, used to uh, these days, right? So we are pleased to have Emily Speck here tonight, uh, who is uh, to help us continue the celebration. She'll be speaking about her reporting on space flight during the commercial space race. Major topic right now is a lot going on in that field, so it's very exciting to hear about that. Uh, and she is uh, just has so much experience in the space reporting biz, and I always personally enjoy uh, her coverage of what's going on. It's awesome following her career and what she is doing. So definitely check her work out and she can explain more about it in her presentation, of course. So just to explain what we're doing here tonight as we did last night, our speaker will present first and then we'll have some time afterwards uh, for some Q and A, it's always nice, kind of a nice part of a presentation. While em Emily is presenting, you can post your questions uh, in the Q and A dialogue box. Uh, and if you have any technical issues, you can post those in the chat box and I'll try to get to them quickly if we can. Uh, we will read through your questions at the end of the presentation and try to get to as many as, as possible. And you may also raise your digital hand uh, if you want to ask your question through the microphone, uh, there is a button for that. So let me formally introduce our speaker tonight, very excited for this. Uh, Emily, Emily Speck is a digital journalist and host of the Space Curious podcast. Definitely check that out, please. Uh, for WKMG and Graham Media. At New Six, uh, Emily covers space flight, politics, and breaking news from the Central Florida region. Before joining WKMG, Emily worked at the Orlando Sentinel, the, New the Naples Daily News, and the National Press Foundation, uh, an international journalism nonprofit. And Emily is a Florida Space Coast na native and UNF alumna. So we are so happy to have her here tonight. And uh, I think we'll just hand it right over to you, Emily. Appreciate it. And thank you very much. All right. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah, sounds good. OK. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I've got a little presentation for you guys. Um, if you have any questions in the chat box, please you know, feel free to, to plug those in there. And um, yeah, we'll go, go, go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see this. Um, just to, you know, kind of reintroduce myself a little bit and thank you so much, Seth, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've been covering space flight now for about seven years and um, I do work for WKMG, we're the CBS station, News 6. It's a, a lot of fun. And uh, this is kind of a special opportunity for me because I always say that my job is kind of talking about what other people's jobs are, you know, and I really kind of love that. So this is, this is kind of fun for me to talk about and different for me to talk about what I do. So we're going to go ahead and start. All right. Okay, so um, we talked about this a little bit. What does a space journalist do? Um, you know, a lot of times when I meet people and I say, hey, I cover space and, you know, I love this beat and it's so exciting. And usually the first question I get is what, what's happening in space? Like what is what does that kind of entail? And it's actually a lot. There are so many different pieces of covering space and space flight and science and astronomy. And so me personally, um, it means covering space flight like rocket launches. It also means covering things leading up to those rocket launches, you know, meeting some astronauts sometimes. It also means covering after a launch, you know, whether that's a robotic mission to say, 
Pluto or the Mars or Jupiter, those are all really exciting to kind of see those, those play out from launch to, to completion of a mission. Um, you know, I also cover astronomy. I really enjoy posting about astronomy. It's, it's kind of a fun thing. I know Seth can probably relate to this, but everyone can kind of relate to looking up in the night sky and being excited about being able to see, you know, Venus and Jupiter in the night sky. Um, it, it also kind of entails covering some pretty complicated scientific discoveries. Um, when I was at the Orlando Sentinel, there was a big discovery about gravitational waves and it was super complicated and I think I did a funny video that involved a balloon or something. So it kind of involves being fun and creative and and doing different things just to just to kind of get people engaged in science and interested and, and let them know why this is important to them. Um, so one thing I wanted to touch on before I talk about a lot of fun coverage is that it's so important that science is communicated and communicated well. Um, this is kind of a, a big pet peeve of mine is that, you know, if, if no one hears about a great discovery, if the general public doesn't hear about it, you know, how are we going to know that this was a great discovery? So I, I hope that I play a small role in communicating that and hopefully um, engaging more people and getting them excited about spaceflight and, and astronomy and science. So that's, I just, I loved this quote. It's from another woman in STEM who has a good point. Nothing in science has any value to society if it is not communicated. All right. So another thing I wanted to touch on is that a space communicator can be anyone. It doesn't have to be a journalist like me. It could be someone like Addie, who you, Addie Dove, who you heard from last night. She is an amazing science communicator because she does interviews with me. She does outreach events. She does all kinds of stuff to help get people engaged. So that's, that's pretty exciting that she does that. And I'm, I'm glad that, that she does because a lot of scientists can, can kind of communicate their own science in different ways and do outreach. And I think that's exciting. Um, I also think it's important that women and girls are part of that communication equation because we offer different perspectives. Sometimes we ask questions that maybe our male colleagues wouldn't think to ask. Uh, and I think that perspective is pretty important. You know, when I first started covering spaceflight the first few times uh, going to Kennedy Space Center, there were not a lot of female space reporters, um, but the good thing is now in kind of the virtual realm, there are a lot more female space reporters now and female space communicators now, and, and there's definitely a lot of resources out there. So one thing I would say if anyone is interested in maybe being a space reporter or a science writer is kind of figuring that out early on. Like maybe if you're an elementary school student, you, you might be interested in getting involved in clubs. There are so many STEM clubs that you could get involved in and, and learning to be passionate about something and then being able to write about it is just, it's, it's really key and it's very, very important. Okay, so on to that commercial space flight thing we were talking about. Um, so commercial space flight, that kind of entails a whole slew of companies and space vehicles and a lot of things that are going on right now. Um, these are just a few of them. You know, we're covering SpaceX launches and we've got Boeing that has Starliner that's gonna be launching astronauts soon as well. We have United Launch Alliance. We've got Rocket Lab. They're launching from New Zealand and soon Virginia. We've got three other companies that are working to launch from the Space Coast in the coming year. So that's really exciting. And so it makes covering space flight super exciting, but also complicated because you got to stay on top of a lot of different working parts, like all these different companies, you know, making sure you're reaching out and staying up on top of all these announcements. It kind of can be exhausting sometimes, you know, we're looking at this week, we've got two SpaceX launches potentially, maybe one tomorrow, possibly Sunday, and then we've got one Tuesday. So it's a, it's a busy, it's a busy schedule to kind of keep up with all this and, and to make sure that we're staying on top of it. Okay, um, so for me personally, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of a special moment for me, it may not seem that special to others because this is something, you know, other people may have seen before. So I started covering spaceflight after the shuttle program ended. You know, it ended in 2011. We haven't sent astronauts 
from the Space Coast since 2011. And so this is something that NASA and its partners, Boeing and, and SpaceX and ULA have been have been working towards, you know, for quite a few years now. So this past year, I covered my first astronaut launch because as a space journalist, unless you could go to Russia, you couldn't really cover an astronaut launch in person. You know, there's a lot of different elements. We can do things virtually, you know, through telecons and, and, and phone conferences and things like that, but it's not quite the same, I feel, as being there in person. So I just wanted to play this quick clip because this summer when Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley launched from Kennedy Space Center, like I said, it was covering the first American astronaut launch from US soil, you know, since 2011. And this is the moment where they drove by on their way to the uh, launch tower to launch pad 39A. And I remember seeing the Teslas pulling up and it was just a really kind of surreal moment because I kept thinking, oh my gosh, these astronauts are about to go strap into this rocket and blast off Earth. And how crazy is that? Um, so this is just a little clip. It's just an iPhone video. So that wasn't much, but it was it was a little something, and I just thought it was kind of special, um, at least for me. <clears throat> there we go. Um, and the reason that kind of was special to me is because right before that moment happened, this happened. So this is Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley saying goodbye to their families before they got in those Teslas and drove to the launch site. Um, and I think that something that a lot of people don't think about when they think about astronauts. Astronauts are heroes, absolutely, because they're putting their lives on the line to explore space and do things that many of us cannot. But their families are also heroes. Now, Bob and Doug are both married to current and former astronauts. So it's putting that into perspective is kind of, is a little different in this case. Um, Megan MacArthur, Bob Bankin's wife is actually going to fly on the next uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon launch. So that's pretty cool. Um, and Doug's wife, Karen, is a recently retired NASA astronaut. So that's those are some pretty cool parents that their boys have. But I think it's important to put this, you know, kind of in terms that people can understand, you know, everyone has a mom and everyone has a dad. And so thinking about your parents getting on a rocket and launching into space and you don't get to see them for a month is kind of a scary thing. So Um, and then we had, let's see, this was the end of 2018, um, Boeing Starliner. Uh, this, so this is the other astronaut capsule that launched on a ULA rocket. It launched without astronauts on a test flight. And this is also part of the commercial crew program. Um, it launched, but it did not reach the International Space Station, which was the goal. So that was kind of a crazy day because the launch happened. It was beautiful. It looked flawless. And then I went back into the um, the newsroom at uh, Kennedy Space Center and about 10 or so minutes into flight, we realized that, you know, something had gone wrong. There was a computer malfunction. It was a timing issue with the spacecraft and the spacecraft was not going to reach its destination. So I took some really cool photos that day, but this is a really kind of not great iPhone photo because after covering this for almost 18 hours straight when I got home and I went to post something on social, I didn't have time to process my images. And this is just, this is what I, this is what I had. So it was kind of, um, yeah, it was just a, kind of a moment there. Um, and then, so after, after that launch and the spacecraft returned to, to earth, it landed in New Mexico and that went okay. Um, Boeing brought it back to Kennedy Space Center to begin examining the spacecraft and determining what went wrong. And, and they have since determined that. And they're gonna try and do the orbital test flight again um, this in, in March. So that's, that's coming up pretty soon. I think it's March 25th is the date. So they're gonna try it again, but um, this was one of these media events kind of after the orbital test flight and that is the spacecraft I'm kind of there with a mic and there's the spacecraft is right behind me. So you can even see the, you know, the burn marks from space flight. You can definitely tell that is a, uh, a used spacecraft. So that's kind of interesting. And 
that's another thing about you know covering space flight is you have to you don't just get to cover the good and amazing things but you also have to follow up on you know this investigation for example you know it's it it took over a year and and following the updates in that and figuring out what was happened because this spacecraft is going to launch astronauts you know and those are american astronauts nasa astronauts and it's super important that they get there safe. So, and it's also taxpayer dollars that are invested into this spacecraft. So as a journalist, you kind of have to track those things down because you're keeping track of American taxpayer dollars. You know, this is you and me that help pay for this. So holding companies accountable and, and Boeing and ULA, ULA wasn't part of the investigation, but they were both very transparent and they both, you know, I can say I was impressed that they answered a lot of questions when they necessarily didn't have to. Um, so that was that was kind of a learning experience for me. Um, okay, so we're gonna get into some fun stuff here. Um, so this year has been kind of a, a bummer, you could say, because with the pandemic, I haven't got to do any traveling, um, but it, for the past few years, I've got to go on some pretty cool trips in regards to space flight. So um, I guess, oh gosh, this would be in 2018. I went to Johnson Space Center in Houston for the commercial crew astronaut announcement. And basically we got to find out who was gonna launch on Starliner and Crew Dragon. And that was, it was a very big, you know, lots of fanfare, it was pretty exciting. And this is after that announcement. And in the middle, that's that's me and one of the commercial crew astronauts, Sunny. She's going to eventually launch on Starliner. So um, we took that selfie because we were both wearing um, Converse shoes, and we had we had a little moment. So I was very excited about it. Um, and let's see. Okay, so the vehicle that looks very futuristic. That's um, in one of the the JSC hangars. They have all these really cool like futuristic kind of test vehicles and this is one of those this is something that could potentially maybe drive on the moon or mars which is pretty cool and then um on the far right me with that really cute helmet right there um that is inside an orion spacecraft um test module so that's kind of one of the things that the astronauts can get in test out the seats do some flight simulations and i'm technically standing on the bathroom i think so um because right after this picture was taken i asked where is the bathroom uh, <laughs> because it's not that big of a capsule it's uh you know maybe about the size of the room that i'm in right now which is a small office and this is the capsule not this exact capsule but this is very similar to the capsule that's going to hopefully take astronauts back to the moon um maybe by 2024 with the Artemis program. Okay. And another trip that um, is very relevant because this bad guy is gonna land on Mars next week. So um, last, let's see, 2018, I got to go to um, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory that's in Pasadena, California. This is where the NASA Mars rover was built and tested and assembled. <clears throat> and um, these, the picture on the left are the wheels of the, of the rover. And we were there the day they were actually putting the wheels on attaching to the body of the rover. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then on the right, you can see the capsule that the, the, the rover is actually traveling through space in right now um, that kind of protects it on its on its journey to space. So on the 18th, that's next Thursday, um, those wheels are going to touch down on the Martian surface if all goes well. And I'll definitely be covering that. And it's and it's very exciting. So getting to go to JPL was was really kind of a dream of mine. I was I was very excited to be there. All right. So I played this for Seth <laughs> before uh, we started the webinar, but um, this has got to be the hardest reporting assignment I've ever had, but also the most fun. Um, I don't know if, if you guys remember, we had a great American eclipse in 2017, and it was a big deal because, you know, this was the first time we've, we've been able to see an, this kind of full eclipse from, from most of the U.S. So... I pitched the idea to my news director that um, <laughs> because plane tickets were quite expensive to fly to anywhere along the path of totality. 
So I pitched my news director, what about a road trip? And she said, yes. And so there on the left is my former coworker, Shannon McClellan. She now works for Good Morning America. And she agreed to go on this trip with me. We drove across country from Florida to Idaho in 51 hours. And we were there for totality. So I'm gonna play this promo because in TV, we do these things, they're like promotional videos and they're cheesy and they're fun and you probably see commercials, but this was, this was very cheesy. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and play it. <laughs> News 6 has Eclipse Fever. Road trip! Come with us as we travel from Orlando to Sun Valley, Idaho, following the path of totality, all on clickorlando.com with stops in Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, Idaho, even Red Buttes. But, but. You're invited on our road trip. Check with us throughout the day to see where we are next. The Great Eclipse, only on ClickOrlando.com from News 6. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. News 6 has Eclipse. Sorry, guys. Okay. So, so like I said, we drove across country uh, 51 hours seven states. We did live interviews in all these different states. We did an interview in Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, and then, oh, and Wyoming. And then we got into Idaho for the actual eclipse. And the whole eclipse event, yes, it takes hours, you know, to eclipse the sun, but really totality, it's like about two minutes. So essentially we drove 51 hours for two minutes. Um, but here's a quick time lapse. This doesn't have sound um, of, of the eclipse, which was pretty cool. Yep. And that was it. <clears throat> um, it was very cool during the eclipse because the temperature dropped, I think about 20 degrees where we were, you know, if you think about from sunrise to sunset, there's a lot of temperature fluctuation, but in this particular case, you know, we went from very bright to very dark and you could feel the temperature dropping and, and it just, the atmosphere felt different. And everyone was kind of applauding and howling and, and kind of yelling at the moon. It was kind of weird and fun. And anyways, so this is um, one of the photos that I took of the actual uh, eclipse of totality. And one of the best ones I think that turned out, it's not a great resolution here in this PowerPoint, but um, you know, I joke that we basically drove through 51 hours for this one photo. <laughs> so um, here's some other pictures. We've got a little guy down here who's enjoying part of the eclipse. That's me and Shannon in the upper left. That was our eclipse watching crew on the right. And then another, another not quite totality, but like almost a totality down there at the bottom right. So um, it was, it was fun. They, this little town, it was called Stanley, Idaho. They had it's like lots, you know, thousands of people came to watch this eclipse here and it was beautiful and everyone was so friendly and we met pretty much everyone who lived in this town because it was, I think the population was, I don't even know, it was less, it was less than 300 people. It's not a lot of people that live there. So we met, we met most of the residents, that's for sure. It was fun. All right, so I, um, I'm just gonna open up to questions if, if we have any questions. I wanted to make sure to share my contact, my email, my Twitter handle, my websites. Um, if anyone you know wants to reach out or has any questions, if you're interested in, in space reporting or you're interested in space communication, I would be happy to connect with you and, and chat. Um, I, I love that kind of stuff. So please feel free to reach out. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we'll still waiting for some questions. That's awesome. I love your slides and, uh, you know, what you've uh, experienced. It's quite amazing. And I love particularly with Sonny Williams and the Converse story, because I, those little moments show you these are real people, you know, and they, you can relate to them. And so I'm sure that was a special moment for you to kind of connect 
It was. I was. Really, I was really nervous because all of my other interactions with astronauts had been, you know, either a phone call or like, you know, maybe a Zoom interview like this. And um, I was there with my coworker Ginger Gadsden. She's an anchor for News Six, and she is she is such a pro. And she just like can interview. She would interview the president, and it would be no big deal to her. Like she just, it's just she's so cool. And for some reason, she was supposed to do that interview and. And she couldn't, I think she had a live hit. So I ended up doing it and I was kind of nervous. And I went up to go start talking to Sunny and I was nervous and she looked down at my shoes and she was like, hey, we match. <laughs> so it was kind of, I was excited about it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. All right, so we got one question um, from Kevin Webb as asking, can you comment about the UAE and the Mars orbiter? Oh yeah, so that, you know, just happened this week. So, you know, I talked a lot about the Mars rover landing. So. We've got the United States that's landing next Thursday, and then we had China and the UAE that that have both now put spacecraft into orbit. And China, they're also going to have a, a lander that goes down to the surface. Um, but the UAE, that was a really big deal because they are only 50 years old as, as a country, and they have they now have a space program, a very ambitious space program. And and one of their first huge achievements is this mission they launched a spacecraft to orbit mars and it successfully made orbit insertion this week um so it was it was very exciting to see that because one of the goals of of this mars hope probe it's called hope and that's the translation in english but is to kind of inspire other people from the uae other arabs to explore careers in stem so i love that and i love that that was kind of the big goal and they're really diving all in you know they have plans for a mars colony they have really really big plans so i am very excited um to see what comes of that mission and what else comes of the the uae space program for sure yeah i agree and it's kind of cool this whole group of spacecraft arriving at mars at the same time and then they're from different countries so that is a yeah. neat aspect and kevin brought up that's another good point that i think about 80 percent of the um people involved in that particular mission were women so that's pretty awesome and that's rare <laughs> for sure yeah mm -hmm. um he also asked it looks like uh, latest news about pluto if you have any I love me some good Pluto news. Um, so I don't have a ton of recent news, but I do know that the, well, at least not about Pluto, it's about the spacecraft, the New, New Horizons spacecraft. Um, you know, it's still out there in the Kuiper Belt and it's still searching for other Kuiper Belt objects to kind of detect and look at. So that's pretty cool. I know there are actually are some more recent studies about Pluto, but I couldn't speak to them and sound like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I wouldn't feel comfortable. But the uh, New Horizons mission and the Pluto images that we got and the, all the studies that came out of that mission are still happening because they're still getting data back from the New Horizons spacecraft. All of that data, it's kind of processed and it takes years. But that's kind of what happens with many spacecraft, right? Like one of the first missions that I covered that um, kind of died i guess i guess you could say um you know the the mercury mission uh messenger it died and they're still using data today to make discoveries about mercury so i i think that's definitely going to happen with pluto as well awesome awesome so then christian has a great question he's asking i'm really interested in space communication what made you decide to get into this field and what were some of the steps you took to get the awesome job you have now <laughs> um so that's kind of a that's kind of an interesting story because I when I I went to journalism school and um, I did not think that I was going to write about space that was not even on my radar at all. Um, but what happened was I left Florida. I moved to Washington D.C. and I lived there for a couple years. And well, I, the first year I lived in D.C. it was 2011, so it was the end of the shuttle program, and that was also the year where different space shuttles went to one flew into DC, one went to California, you know, one is in, in Florida still. And so I was in DC when one of them came, I, I think it's Discovery, but I don't want to, I don't want to correct myself and say the wrong space shuttle, um, flew over the National Mall. And I was with, I had a fellowship at the time and I made all of my coworkers go walk down to the National Mall, which was like a mile and a half walk. We walked down to the National Mall and we watched the shuttle fly over, it was on an airplane, but 
fly over the mall. And they were just like asking me tons of questions because they were not from Florida. So it wasn't like they grew up kind of watching this. And I found myself just kind of answering questions. And then when I moved back to Florida and I, I got my first newspaper job, again, when, you know, it was right when SpaceX had started launching more frequently. And again, I found myself answering questions from other people who weren't from Florida. And then I started kind of getting assignments to write about it. So it kind of fell into it that way. And then at the Orlando Sentinel, same kind of thing. Like I really liked planetary science and they asked me to restart the space blog. And I started really covering the New Horizons mission and other planetary missions and astronomy. And I really enjoyed it. And I guess I had a knack for it because they kept asking me to do it. And um, at WKMG, I, I guess they like that I really like space because they've allowed me to continue and let me do some really, really cool things. So that's kind of a backwards way of, of coming into it. Um, I grew up in Brevard County, a few minutes from Kennedy Space Center. My dad is a recently retired a NASA engineer. And um, so it was kind of always part of my life, but not something that I thought like would be a career. I, so it's kind of a, a long way around it. That's great. And you're correct. It is Discovery. And okay. uh, funny is uh, I saw it when it left Kenny Space Center. I was there while they watched it. And you, you had the tail end of it. So so that's my cool. Cool. dad was there at Kennedy Space Center when it took off. So I think he, I remember he sent me, this was, you know, a while ago. So he sent me a photo of it flying over the Space Center. And then I think I sent him one of it flying over the National Mall. So that was, that was kind of cool. <laughs> All right. So we have uh, Jason Schreiner asking, can you tell us about your favorite news story you've covered? Oh, that's tough. Um, oh, that's, it's kind of like picking you know, a favorite child or something. <laughs> um, so I have a, a podcast, it's called Space Curious, and th those are not focused, say, on particular stories, but I've really enjoyed using them for storytelling. Um, and I would have to say that I have maybe a favorite episode. Um, I, it's, I kind of did it because, you know, we talked about how this is the first astronaut launch that I've, I've covered. So we kept asking the the press corps, the space press corps kept asking the astronauts, Bob and Doug, about the bathroom on Crew Dragon. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just like kept coming up in press conferences. Like, obviously, we're asking these astronauts who can fly upside down and do physics and all this amazing stuff and are putting their lives in line. And we're asking about the toilet. And um, so I kind of wondered, like, why? Why do we do that? Why do we think that's so interesting that, you know, they're these everyday people, but they're also astronauts. And so I spoke to uh, former astronaut Terry Burtz about that kind of stuff, like about the things that you don't expect in space and kind of what it's like to be asked that stuff. And also what it's like to launch into space and leave your family and put your life on the line. So that's kind of one of my favorite projects from this from this last year, I'd say. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fun, that's great. Uh, Kevin Webb asks, are there any plans to go to Venus as all seems quiet? Ooh, um, okay, so Yes and no. Um, there are a couple, I actually did a podcast on this recently too. Um, so there's a couple proposed missions right now to NASA. There, there's a couple different ways you can send a spacecraft to another planet. Um, but right now there's, I know of two that are up for the uh, discovery program. That's the NASA discovery program. So that's like the, the small to medium sized spacecraft. Um, and there are two that NASA is reviewing that could get selected to go to Venus, and they're pretty cool. There's also another one that's kind of, it's called a flagship mission, like one of those really big, like a, the Mars rover is like a, a flagship mission. These are the billion dollar missions. So there's another one to Venus um, that, that NASA is, is currently reviewing right now. So no plans right now, but it's possible, you know, within the next few, few years ago, or so we could have one to look forward to. But Venus is one of my new favorite planets because um, it's not a very nice place. And apparently it had at one point a lot in common with Earth. So we should maybe pay attention to it. So I, I hope there's a mission there soon. I totally agree. It's sometimes sort of uh, left behind a little bit in our exploration. So I agree. All right. So another one from Kevin. He says, I am 69. So being a teen in the 60s, space exploration was exciting. Do you feel you, we will ever recapture that magic? And he says, uh, hi, I'm from Thailand. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> um, I, I hope so. I think that within the next few years, as 
you know, the launch cadence picks up and hopefully, you know, when we return astronauts to the moon, I think that that kind of magic will return. I also think it's, it's still there. This year was, was hard because, you know, we talked about, we had the first astronaut launch from U.S. soil in, you know, about nine years, but the fanfare that we would have normally seen for that kind of thing, like think about the shuttle days, wasn't really there because of the pandemic. I mean, a lot of people came out to watch this launch. Like, don't even get me wrong. There were still a lot of people that, that came to Brevard to watch the launch and it was very exciting. But I think, you know, once we have more people vaccinated and the pandemic is under control, I think you're gonna see a lot more interest, definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. I'll, I'll move on to another question here. Um, so personally, I have one uh, that I, I've been thinking about is, uh, is there a particular mission or um, a launch that you are looking forward to the most this year? Which one is really kind of capturing your attention? Um, so I'm really excited at the end of the year, towards the end of the year, there are um, two moon landers that are going to launch from the space coast so uh you know we know about the artemis program so that's nasa's human return to the moon that's the artemis umbrella and then kind of under that is something called um the com uh, commercial lunar payload services program so that's another acronym there nasa loves acronyms um which stands for clips it's clips um and there were a few companies selected under these contracts to send um, landers to the moon and bring NASA science. So, you know, to do so conduct some studies, basically to learn more about the moon's surface for astronaut arrival. So there's two private companies that are going to launch hopefully towards the end of this year. And I'm really excited for those. I know one is slated for November, and I want to say that's the Astrobotics moon lander, but I'm not 100% sure if, if that's that's correct. They're late, they're late this year. Like I think we're gonna see last quarter of, of this year. So I'm excited about those. That's great. Um, someone has a question kind of chat here. Uh, with the new president, do you know Biden's view on space exploration, hence the funding for it? That's a really good question. And um, one that I would love to know. <laughs> uh, we don't have a, a whole lot of guidance on what Biden thinks about funding for the space program. We do know that, you know, under the Trump administration, there were a lot of uh, climate and earth science programs that, that saw cuts and that wasn't maybe a priority there, but under the Biden administration, I, I think that that will again be a priority. I think that's been, he's been pretty clear about that. Um, as far as the Artemis program, you know, probably within the last week or so, his press secretary just said, you know, we do support the Artemis program. We're excited about it. So that's good. But yeah, we definitely need to get some kind of more clear guidance before I feel comfortable saying exactly how much funding support will be there. Awesome. Uh, we don't have any more questions right now, but um, is there anything you want to let us know about what you're doing or coming up, you know, any kind of project you're working on or anything uh, that you're doing that, you know, our folks may want to know about or tune into? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of launches this year. We've got some pretty exciting stuff happening and we'll definitely be covering them at New 6 and at clickorlando.com. Um, but one thing I would love to ask is if anyone has any space related questions, please send them to me. Um, our website is spacecurious.show and there's a form on there and you can submit your questions. We're working on season two of the show. So, um, you know, I'm not all, epi all episodes are kind of uh, pre-recorded and edited, but I'm still working on a few more. So I would love to answer some questions. We're going to do some historic uh, episodes this year. I'm really excited. One of the first episodes is going to be about uh, Jackie Cochran. She was the first woman to, to uh, break the sound barrier. So that was kind of exciting. Um, I really didn't know a lot about her and um, maybe that's not directly space related, but there's a lot of little stories like that that kind of led to space flight that, you know, maybe not as many people know about. So any questions, it's, um, let me see if I can actually type it in here. Uh, and the podcast is on, um, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Spotify, Stitcher, um, anywhere basically you download podcasts, so. Sorry, I had to retype it for all the attendees too, so it was just for us too. 
So, oh, okay. All right. Well, very awesome. Thank you for posting that link. You know, we'll definitely check that out. Hope everyone else does as well. So uh, with that, I don't think I hear any more questions, but it's great that you, we can reach out to you uh, yeah. for further <laughs> questions and all that. So I think that's really important. Um, but anyway, uh, let me pin my video here just for the outro. So uh, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. I'll pop my video back in here too. If, uh, I got to you know, be in the video here for a second. There you go. I'm back. Hello. Um, so I, we really uh, appreciate your time here and joining us uh, for this you know, special occasion. You know what we're trying to celebrate and uh, hearing from voices like yourself. Uh, is uh, very, very important um, in this endeavor and to kind of spread the word and just, you know, hopefully increase diversity in science and, and bring more people to the field, you know, um, which is what, we, what we're all about, you know, and I think it, it's good for humankind and for the world. So I appreciate you being part of that and uh, joining us tonight. So thank you very much. And uh, we are, are happy to celebrate uh, International Day of Women, Girls in Science. And we are continuing this celebration uh, tomorrow night uh, on Saturday at 6 p.m. We actually just premiering a recorded conversation uh, with uh, that our own planetarium coordinator Jason Schreiner had with Ariane Cornell, who is the director of astronaut and orbital sales at Blue Origin. Uh, you can access her talk on on Saturday from our Moaz Daytona YouTube and Facebook page. You can kind of tune in there and you can find it. And again. Uh, just to kind of sign off here, uh, again, happy International Day of Women, Girls, and Science, our continuation of it. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Very good. And uh, just uh, with that, take care and have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.